Climate Conversation podcast. This is a podcast that we've started to complement a climate conversation movie, which is the brainchild of Walt Johnson. And today we're going to have a great discussion with Dr. William Happer. Uh, he is an American physicist, and uh, I'm sure that we're going to learn a lot. Uh, on the podcast with me is uh, uh, Walt Johnson, who is the executive director of A Climate Conversation. Welcome, Walt. Thank you. Thank you. And Dave O'Rourke, who is a spokesperson for A Climate Conversation, and then Dr. William Happer. And so we're going to learn a lot today. So Dave, why don't you take it from here? Well, Dr. Happer, first of all, thank you for spending some some part of Good Friday. This is being recorded on Good Friday, and, and we're very grateful to have you here, to, to get to talk to you, to spend some time with you. And I, I think I can speak for everyone in the country <laughs> when I say that we're lucky to have this conversation with you. Uh, I'm fascinated by the entirety of th this worldwide phenomenon, this, this food fight featuring a teenager from Norway or wherever she's from as the star witness, how this has continued to go on and what the motivation set is, because it's, it's, it's clear to me from as a non-scientist and from what I've been able to see that the entire argument is based upon predictive models. And this is the purview of scientists. So I'm, and I know that you've had a point of view about this uh, for quite some time. I'm, I'm curious about the global more warming models that have been used and are continue and continue to be used and your take on that, what, what evidence we have that these models are, are um, faithful representations of what the future might be. Well, you know, if you look at the performance of the models, uh, they've uh, all predicted much more warming than has been observed. Uh, everyone uh, agrees on that. And, um, so I, I personally think that CO2 probably causes some warming. You know, this is my field. I know about radiation transfer. I've done a lot of work on that in connection with lasers in the atmosphere. And I think, you know, if you double CO2, you might get about a degree centigrade of warming, probably less. But uh, it's very hard to see how you'd get much more than that. And the models are predicting three degrees, four degrees, even greater amounts. And... Uh, it's really hard to understand how they can uh, keep a straight face with these predictions because what it really means is that the climate system has very strong positive feedback, you know, that amplify the direct warming that is easy to calculate by factors of three or four. So that's huge positive feedback. You know, most feedbacks in nature are not positive, they're negative. There's even a famous, uh, principle, the Le Chatelier's principle, which basically says that natural feedbacks are mostly negative. <laughs> so it's amazing that people take these things seriously. They're clearly junk. <laughs> but they're disguise, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, the, the old fable about the Gordian knot, you know, Alexander is about to conquer the world and the priests say, well, you can't conquer it because you can't untie this knot. You know, and this knot has always been right. And so uh, that's uh, the way these uh, models are today. You know, they, someone, some brave politician should take out his sword and cut him apart. <laughs> so we've, we've been fortunate in this podcast to meet and, and converse with some really wonderful and fascinating people. One of them was Patrick Moore. Yeah, he's a he good friend. His yeah. universal theory of scary stuff. Uh-huh. And so you see in COVID, which was an emergency, yeah. which politicians, I don't think it's unfair or subject. I, don't, I think it's just real observations to say politicians took advantage of that crisis to do some political things because you can't see DNA and you can't see, you know, a, a germ. You can't see the the... You can't see any of it. It's not observable and you can't go visit it. And here we have the same thing. No one understands what carbon dioxide is. Most people don't understand that that's what plants are required in order to conduct, you know, to do photosynthesis. 
And so they have this great thing where there's an emergency that says we're going to have another mass extinction because of global warming. And yet global warming has been associated with remarkable periods of human flourishing and, and, and global greening. It just seems inverted. And I'm wondering how can a person achieve a level, you know, of science, go, go th take your path mm -hmm. of education, become, you know, become a, a professor of physics where Einstein taught. Mm -hmm. and observe this argument and not um, rebel against it. And yet there's this power of cancel culture is very strong. Well, you know, the this is a very complicated movement and it has uh, many people driven by different motives. For example, there are lots of very sincere people who since they were little children have heard that, you know, the world is coming to an end. I think it's disgraceful what we've done to our children. You know, they're trusting normally. They uh, would, would an adult lie to me with my parents or my preacher or rabbi lie to me? And it answers yes. And uh, so, uh, so we see these tragic cases of uh, young people actually committing suicide because they think the world is coming to an end or they're not going to get married, not going to have children. And uh, it's all based on a lie. You know, it's, it's not true. But the motives, uh, they range from sincere belief for these poor kids, you know, who've been brainwashed and pretty hard to be deprogram someone once they've been brainwashed. That's, that's well known to people who are uh, profiting in various ways, you know, in terms of uh, money. Uh, you know, people make a lot of money from uh, taxpayer subsidies for sustainable energy or from power, you know, you get elected if you can convince enough people to that you're the person to save the planet, you know. <laughs> uh, so I often joke that it's, uh, it's uh, it's sort of a uh, toxic marriage of uh, a religious cult and organized crime. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, unfair to many people who are sincere. There are even some sincere scientists who believe that what they're doing uh, makes sense. And some of them actually are doing useful science. But I think the science of climate has been set back by 50 years by this political interference and uh, this a forced uh, focus on greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide uh, as, uh, you know, the ultimate threat to mankind. It, it's no such thing. And climate really is important. It'd be nice to understand, for example, why was there a little ice age and why was there a medieval warming? And what really is causing the current warming? It started in 1800, <laughs> long before there was any uh, increase in CO2. And, uh, you know, 50 years ago, there were people making progress on answering these questions, and but that's ground to a halt because you're forced to follow this uh, narrative that it's all due to greenhouse gases and it's all due to people. <laughs> Dr. Happer, um, we, uh, I just watched your film that you were involved with, um, Climate the Movie, and it's a great compliment to the movie that, that uh, Walt um, created a climate conversation. Two things. One of the things that I realized is that the green and the green movement is the green that's going into a lot of people's pockets. Right. And in your film, uh, the problem will not be solved because there's a lot of people that are making a lot of money off of this. So you have that aspect of it. However, where we are headed is um, really dangerous, both from an economic standpoint and a human standpoint for humankind. And uh, we, we've got a real, a real battle here, but shedding light on this issue is so important. No, I agree with you, Kim. Uh, there are lots of dumb things that people do that I don't pay any attention to. For example, I have good friends who buy horoscopes every week and uh, cost them something. And it's all right with me. I mean, if, they, if that makes them happy, they're entitled to that. But they don't force everyone to sign up to this obsession that they have. And so the, uh, the, the thing that's dangerous about climate is that it 
you know, if you really uh, look at what's being demanded, it's a suicide pact. It's economic suicide. It won't work. And it's more than economic suicide because, you know, we can't feed the world. We can't provide for the people in the world without, you know, the modern industrial economy. And we can't even improve the environment. If you look at what improves the environment, you make people wealthy and uh, all of a sudden they start picking up trash and cleaning up the environment and buying, you know, land for parks and, uh, you know, preserves. And if you don't have that, then you've got a wasteland. And so what we're doing is just completely opposite to what has been demonstrated to improve the environment. We're trying to keep everybody poor, you know, barefoot and pregnant in, in the third world. You know, what, what, what a disgrace. Yeah. So well, why, and I, oh, I'm sorry, go, Kim, go ahead. You know, we, you talk about a, a society on what, the success of a society is, is what we pass on to our children. And the fact that we are passing on fear and anxiety. I Initially, when I heard about anxiety of our children from this whole climate movement, it, it didn't really register with me that it's a real thing. But it's a real thing now with our children. And that's a travesty. Yeah, I mean, we've done that to our children Throughout history, for example, if you look at the Salem witch trials, the chief accusers were these poor little girls, you know, they're just teenagers, preteens, and uh, who went to church every Sunday and heard these fire and brimstone sermons. And so sure enough, they saw witches everywhere and uh, started accusing everybody of being a witch. And, uh, you know, then they had all these Harvard trained judges who came and gave them a fair trial and, and hung them, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's uh, it's not a new phenomenon in human history. <laughs> I don't know why they call us homo sapiens. You know, sapiens are supposed to be wise, but we're anything but wise. <laughs> uh, one of the, the themes or one of the major parts of the conversation in Walt's movie, A Climate Conversation, is, is um, the absence of a responsible cost-benefit analysis. So what we hear is the cost is uh, a global extinction, a mass extinction, and the cost is half the people of the earth will be dead by 2050. The cost is, you know, I don't know, everyone dying and, and, and you know, Gaia disappearing or something. And the benefit is assumed to be the absence of the cost. And yet when you look at economic models of it, it appears that achieving net zero, what well, just in the United States is a hundred plus trillion dollar proposition. Achieving it globally is something like 5% of global GDP, which is higher than GDP is, right? GDP mm -hmm. globally doesn't grow at 5%. So it's, you're looking at a, a, a diminution of wealth just from the absolute hard dollar cost before the consideration of any externalities. Uh, one of the things, and Walt might want to talk about this, apparently the rush to, without environment, without any real responsible environmental impact reports to put wind farms offshore in New England has has taken about 10% of the right whale population and no one even knows why it wasn't speculated upon before that those things weren't, weren't considered. So the costs in dollars appear to be extraordinary. The, the, the cost in land use appears to be unlike anything ever contemplated and the environmental cost all along the supply chain of, of sourcing, developing, producing, implementing, and then ultimately trying to recycle or, or deal with the waste associated with these products is extraordinary, extraordinary, unknown, but huge. What might be the benefit? Can you think of a benefit associated with this that we could put a dollar cost on or a dollar value on? 
No, Dave, I can't. I can't think of any benefit. You know, there's a joke in physics that the um, the hardest thing to get right on a theory is what is the sign? Is it a benefit or is it a detriment? And they've simply gotten the sign wrong here. That you know, more CO two actually does benefit the world. That, that's clear. And if you look at the history of geological history, all warming periods have been good for life. Uh, even before humans showed up in the geological record, when the earth was warm, the numbers of species were much larger, you know, it was clearly a more vital earth than when it was cold. <laughs> so if you want to end life on earth, you make things cold. If you want to make it better, you make things warm. So none of it makes any sense. And <laughs> you can already see the greening of the earth from CO2. That's very clear from satellite images that you know, go back to the you know, late 70s. And, uh, uh, and that's because of more CO2. It's not raining more. It's just that plants you know, are able to grow in areas that used to be too dry. Because the plant has more CO2, it doesn't waste as much water. And so that's a huge effect, a uh, very positive effect for all life on Earth, humans, for, you know, for the animals that live off the plant, for the plants themselves. So it's, it's crazy, you know, it's, it's really all pain and no gain. There is no gain. You know, I, I, I say this not out of uh, just pontification, because this is my field. I really understand the science more than most climate scientists. And uh, there is no threat from greenhouse gases. They, they, they're, uh, they have a very small effect. They, they probably cause a little bit of warming, but you know, if you double CO2, you'd be hard pressed to predict more than one centigrade if you were honest about one centigrade of warming. That's nothing, you know, that uh, there's one centigrade difference every time I open and close the door to my office, you know, I don't even notice it. You can't feel that much. Uh, so, you know, we, we've succeeded or they have succeeded in turning a, a true molehill into a mountain and uh, nobody seems to notice. <laughs> well, Walt, you noticed it. You spent some time as a young buck in the San Juan Forest, if I'm not mistaken, and you've spent some time north of, I'm not sure if you were north of the Arctic Circle, but way up there. Way north. Yeah. North um, of Alaska. You've actually disproved uh, Dr. Moore's theory. <laughs> you did go. <laughs> you, know, you did go and observe. So, uh, And uh, yes, as a result, I've, I've kept very good track of the Arctic ice because it yeah. did bother me when I was up there. Yeah. We had too much Arctic ice uh -huh. and, and we almost got stuck for the winter. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, uh, yes, the Arctic ice did recede for a little bit, but it has been extending itself for yeah. now 20 years, which is, is now called not weather, but climate. Yeah, yeah. You have to have a certain length of time for something to happen before you can say the climate is, is affected. But yeah. the Arctic ice is, is getting larger, and, and it makes my life more difficult when I'm up there with because I'm usually in a boat somewhere between the ice and the land. <laughs> A dangerous place to be. Uh, have to share that space with all the polar bears, and they're not yes. as warm and cuddly as they look. <laughs> when I was up there, another boat hit some ice and, and uh, killed half the people on it. Uh -huh. Working, they were uh, up there hauling pipeline in for the Alaska pipeline at the time. Yeah. Well, I've never been to the North Slope. I've been as far north as Fairbanks, and uh, I went. I took a special trip to look at the. Uh, pipeline. I was fascinated by the engineering. It was really very well done. You know, uh, if, you know, if you're a propeller head techie like me, it, this is the sort of thing that turns you on. <laughs> but uh, every American, if they get a chance, should visit uh, Glacier Bay, which is the panhandle of Alaska, because there you see the natural effects of climate uh, just very dramatically. Glacier Bay at the time it was first charted by Vancouver, which would have been, I don't know, 1790 or 1800. And that time period, it was full of ice all the way out to the Pacific and a little bit beyond. There was a snout of ice that Vancouver recorded right out in the Pacific. 
And so that was, say, 1800. And by 1870, most of the ice was gone. You know, so there began dramatic uh, re recession of the glaciers in Glacier Bay and all over the world, but it's very dramatic there. And it, it was so striking that John Muir, you know, the great environmentalist from California, made a trip to Alaska to try and understand what's happening to the glaciers. Nobody was accusing SUV drivers then, <laughs> but they, they were clearly receding. And so he wrote a wonderful book called Travels in Alaska. You can still get it and it's worth reading. It's very interesting. But one of the things he did was he talked to the local Indians at Glacier Bay and they said, oh yeah, you know, we've been here and our forefathers have been here for centuries and uh, Light Ice has only been here for two or 300 years and uh, Muir, you could see, didn't quite believe them. But the Indians were right, you know, the, this was ice that formed during the Little Ice Age. And uh, if you go back to the time of the Norse settlements, there wasn't any ice in Glacier Bay then either, right? So there are these enormous uh, natural warmings and coolings of the earth. They've happened all the time the last 10,000 years, the Holocene. And they look exactly what we're experiencing now. So you can't look at the warming and it's not very much uh, and tell whether it, it's just another natural phase or maybe some of it is CO2. I think a little bit is CO2. I'd be, I guess maybe a half a degree or a little bit less, but it's not enough to, to worry about. Dr. Happer, who so decided... What, what we, oh, sorry. Who decided what the uh, perfect temperature for the Earth is and what was that year? <laughs> well, uh, that's another question. Is You know, if you really could control the temperature of the Earth, would it be better to raise the temperature or lower it? And as I think as we discussed a little earlier, history shows it's always better to turn up the temperature or get it a little warmer. You know, if you look at how this works, and uh, you can see this from observations, um, when things warm, it typically warms mostly at night and in the winter. You know, if you look at maximum temperatures, almost nothing is happening to maximum temperature. And that's what people are worried about is maximum temperatures. And theory also predicts very little effect on maximum temperatures from greenhouse gases. But, but the natural effects, whatever they are, are seem to be similar. They, they affect low temperatures, they affect nighttime temperatures. And all of that's good. You know, I have a, a backyard garden and uh, I worry about when the uh, last frost will be this spring so I can put out my plants. And, uh, you know, I've been watching that like a hawk, you know, now for 40 years, I can't see any difference actually. So, uh, you know, whatever is happening, it, it's very hard to measure. There may have been a tiny amount of warming, but certainly backyard gardeners don't notice it. <laughs> yeah. So can we, I'm interested in one of the, I've done a little homework and of course I'm familiar with Dr. Happer. We're just so, we're, I'm just so, you know, very, very, we're all so very, very pleased to have you with us and just honored. But I know that you've made some presentations and in one of them, I think you may have said that it is immoral to deprive the world of fossil fuels. I'd love to hear you talk about that. That's absolutely true. And, um, you know, that's, again, related to the environment, because if you want uh, a clean environment, you have to have a prosperous society. You know, if you're living hand to mouth and you don't even know how you're going to feed your kids tonight, why do you care whether you strip the hills of firewood and, uh, you know, whatever you do, you know, you've got to survive. And so much of the world is like that. It's subsistence living. It doesn't have to be subsistence living. And part of the reason is they don't have fossil fuels. They don't have electricity. They don't have good transportation. Africa, some parts of South America are like that. And so by depriving these people of uh, the benefits of fossil fuels, and uh, we're making the environment worse. We're uh, hurting children, children don't survive, you know, so, or they're forced into labor, you know, the poor little kids in the Congo, you're mining cobalt. So, you know, Californians can drive their Teslas. And uh, 
So the, no, none of it is moral, you know, it's completely immoral, I would say. And, you know, for example, there are all these people demanding that the third world stop doing modern agriculture, you know, go back to organic farming. And uh, the, the real showcase of that was Sri Lanka four or five years ago, where the government came in supported by Western billionaires and uh, announced that we were going to go back to organic farming in Sri Lanka. And so no more nitrate, no, no more phosphate for your rice and for your tea. And so the predictable thing happened within a year, the rice crop failed, the price of rice went up by a factor of 10, the tea crop failed, the foreign exchange stopped, <laughs> you know, and uh, the poor people, you know, were desperate. So there were riots and demonstrations and the government was run out of Sri Lanka. You know, the president just barely escaped with his life, a helicopter to rescue him from his palace and you know, blew him off to Thailand to refuge. But, you know, if you give these people, these uh, fanatics their way, they cause enormous damage. And uh, most people are not willing to take it. The people of Sri, Sri Lanka were not willing to take it. I don't think there's any people in anywhere in the world who will take it, you know, when it comes to that. And so I, it's pretty clear that this whole thing will sooner or later collapse when you know, the events of Sri Lanka happen on a larger scale in some big country, Germany, maybe, California, maybe. But but uh, it, it just can't go on. But in the meantime, huge amounts of damage are being done. And so we should try to stop it in a less dramatic way <laughs> yeah, before, you know, it's uh, a, a case of tirage, you know, triage and, and, and picking up the pieces. <laughs> So we have, I was in uh, Denver just last week and I, I went to the Museum of Natural History. They have a, a, a little, <laughs> beautiful little thing where there's a bell jar with a mouse in it and a bell jar with a plant in it. And they created a little airflow chamber between the two bell jars, which are otherwise cut off mm -hmm. from the, you know, they're, they're sealed. Right. The mouth, the mouse exhales carbon dioxide, right. the trees ex exhales oxygen, and this little ecosystem can go on forever. Right. Anyone, any school kid, anybody, all the little people there that were in the museum when I was there can see this. It's right there. And yet, uh, we're well, not yeah, it's, it's absolutely astonishing that they've managed to demonize carbon dioxide because, as you say, it's really the gas of life. You know, life uh, is built of three components, you know, sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. Those are the starting elements. Then you have to add a little nitrogen and phosphorus and other things, but those are the main things. That's what's involved in photosynthesis. So if you cut off CO2, life ends immediately. <laughs> you know, or if you cut off water, or if you cut off sunlight, any one of the three. <laughs> and uh, we've been perilously close to cutting off CO2. The levels of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere now have been too low for most of life. You know, at the peak of the last uh, uh, glacial maximum, 20,000 years ago, it got down to 180 parts per million, which is only a few tens of parts per million above starvation levels for uh, a good fraction of plants, C3 plants, you know, which is most of our crop plants. And so uh, it's lucky that it didn't go any lower. There, there's pretty good evidence that there was, was plant starvation at high altitudes. For example, uh, there's uh, the Gobi Desert was probably much bigger during the last glacial maximum because plants at those altitudes were starving from not enough CO2. You know, Western United States probably was a dust bowl and, and there's, there's good geological evidence for that. So CO2, low levels of CO2 are really bad news for life and high levels are great. You know, you can uh, look at the geological record and sort of optimum levels are several thousand 
parts per million, and we're only 400, maybe 430, I don't know what it is today, but way, way below the optimum values that uh, life would prefer. You, if I'm not mistaken, you were a co-founder or perhaps the founder of the CO2 Coalition? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Is that right? So can you, can, I'm sure, I, I don't, I, it's not a household name, even though everyone here is familiar with it. And we actually had Gregory Wrightstone. Right, right. I believe he's the executive director of the CO2 Coalition right. now right. in one of our podcasts. So can you talk a little bit about the, that organization and its goals and w what you're trying to achieve there? Well, uh, the CO2 Coalition is a group of scientists and engineers and economists and other people who are interested in climate and would like to do sensible things on it. I, you know, uh, and the executive director is uh, Greg Wrightstone, who you've talked to, and he's doing a terrific job. And uh, we're trying to get out the truth about uh, carbon dioxide and climate and uh, agriculture. <laughs> uh, so we have a website, which, you know, if you Google on CO2 Coalition, the website should pop up. But so far, Google has not censored us. and. Uh, Although, you know, below our website, you'll see page after page of hate, you know, mail, you know, people uh, trying to blacken our reputation, but it doesn't seem to matter. You know, people are still being influenced, and I hope more and more as time goes on. So I, I think of ourselves as sort of an anti-Sierra club or, or an, <laughs> that uh, we love this environment. And we know that CO2 is helping the environment. And so uh, we are the real environmentalists. We're trying to uh, educate people that they've been badly deceived by, you know, this cult or this uh, crime family or whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, they should wake up, you know, before too much damage is done. Well, that's why your message of, of uh, what you do, your work, and of course, Walt, this had been on his heart for a long time to come up with a movie, a climate conversation. And Walt, just share a little bit more about that if this is the first time someone has seen uh, our podcast. Well, as an earth scientist, uh, I had a varied background. I got to work with a lot of people. One of the persons I worked with directly was uh, Dr. Shaw, Bill Shaw. He was the world's foremost micropaleontologist. He had a big hand in this, this uh, temperature chart that we have of the earth. And, and I knew him. I worked with him. Uh, he'd look at the little bugs and he'd say, the warms up. This is what happens to the little bugs. And this is what happens when it gets cold. And, and he was very good at all that. And here, all of a sudden, we're, we're not paying any attention to all the knowledge we had uh, from, from other people that have gone on before. And when I looked at everything, I just saw that we would have a totalitarian society if we went the way we are. And the cost began to become a concern. And, and uh, then Ken Gregory just came out with his, his uh, numbers on, on the cost. And he probably, we've discussed it ourselves in this group, uh, Ken was probably too low because he did not include the cost of uh, reclaiming all, all these things we do. The, there's a lot of waste damage there. So it, it just drove me. It, it felt like a, a higher power said I had to do something to where I I, uh, I pulled this out of my IRA account two years now <laughs> to, to help make the movie. And, and, and I was driven to kind of what needed to be done. And I put that together, but I depend on the people in it. I mean, that was where I was the genius, really because it came together just so well and all the people and it, it made a good product and it's, and I think it helps. That's where I am. Thank you. Let me just uh, jump in because I, as I say, I, I saw, I think the inaugural showing of the film in Orlando at the uh, Heartland conference, and it is a very, very good film. So if you want to learn a lot about climate, uh, in a relatively short time, sit down and watch that movie. It's, it's a great movie. Thank you. Dr. Happer, in, I think in preparation for 
uh, the podcast, David mentioned something about the great takings that we're seeing with uh, all of this land that's being committed to wind and solar. And it really is a direct assault upon the idea of property rights, but it's being couched in green or conservation, but it is such a takings of the opportunity for everyday people to own property. And it's stunning to see the amount of land that is being taken uh, away from, from uh, people having property rights. Well, uh, Kim, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the great uh, advantages our country has had, the United States has been private property. You know, for example, uh, if you compare us to, uh, you know, Russia, to the Soviet Union, you know, they were always behind, you know, things move kind of slowly, you know, innovations would occur in the United States and some of it would eventually trickle over there. But the reason was that here uh, you could take your own initiative. It was your own land. You could do what you wanted. Someone wants to drill for oil, they could come and drill it. If you want to plant soybeans, you could plant soybeans. If you want sugar beets, you, it was your decision. It was all yours. The government didn't tell you what to do. And of course, lots of people made mistakes, but they learned from them. And so you, you look at your neighbor and uh, if he did something that worked, you do it too. And uh, so it was, uh, and there was no government that had to cover its rear end for making a false call, you know, and that, that's the problem with governments. They, most of the things they decide to do turn out not to work, but then they can't admit that they're not working. So they double down on it and it gets worse and worse. And that's certainly what the history of Russia was. They did one stupid thing after another. And, uh, you know, one was hoping that uh, they were coming out of that uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now they're stuck in this horrible war with Ukraine. I, I feel so bad that, you know, for both Ukraine and Russia, you know, it's the last thing that either country needs. And uh, But Ukraine was had the same problem, you know, they... Uh, nobody owned anything and so nobody could do anything sensible <laughs> right so t taking is a terrible thing you know the constitution actually has an article says or maybe it's an amendment but uh it's the takings uh part of the constitution it's being violated left and right nowadays and uh you know do we have a constitution or not you know so people should stand up and say this really is unconstitutional we're a society that uh, has uh, come together and we've agreed to live with each other, but these are the rules and the rules are being violated. And uh, if you're violating the rules, why should I follow the rules, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. If I could add on to that, no one ever goes to Midland, Texas for a vacation, but they have the, the oil museum there. And of course, here in the United States, we have private property of minerals. Right. And, and it was just, it's astonishing how fast innovation really took place. I mean, for, from in a very short time, people really came up with a lot of new tools and devices to, to get oil out of the ground. It was done in a free market manner. It's, right. That's interesting to see. No, I agree with you, Walt. It, it, someone should write a good book about that, pointing out how how efficient it was and how good it was for America, actually, you know, we really benefited from that. Well, so I, I do think it's interesting back on this Ukraine Russia thing, because John Kerry, who is sort of the aging poster child for climate alarmism has just let given some great advice to the Russians um, that they can improve their street cred. Uh, no matter what they do in Ukraine by, you know, getting on board the Paris uh, Agreement. I was just fascinated by it. I mean, it's sort of like every time you think that John Kerry can't say something more outrageously absurd, he, he is able to. <laughs> he, yeah. is, he can deliver the goods. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, John Kerry's a piece of work, you know. I, I don't know what to say. Of <laughs> yeah, Al Gore's the same way. Uh, he, they uh, um, they don't know any science, you know. Al Gore was a C or D student at Harvard, and uh, and uh, that was probably a gift because his daddy was a senator, <laughs> and uh, Kerry wasn't any better, you know. So here are science spokesman uh, or C&D students. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, 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 again, I want to say how personally lucky I feel, fortunate I feel to get to speak with you. Uh, a man who knew Robert Oppenheimer and a man who also know, <laughs> knows John Kerry. <laughs> you know, it's quite a little bookend of American history there when you look at um, one of really uh, arguably one of the greatest scientists that's ever come out of, of our country and you know a politician and well, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer was a, a I would say he was a very good scientist he wasn't a great scientist but what he was really great at was he was one of the best scientific administrators that the world has ever seen you know we started the Manhattan Project uh, a year before Oppenheimer took it over and it was going nowhere. It was just a shamble because the director at the time really was a great scientist. It was Gregory Bright, who was uh, considerably more distinguished than Oppenheimer and had done more important things. But he was a terrible administrator, <laughs> you know, so he couldn't get people to work together. He was fighting with them all the time. He, he couldn't stand to have people working for him who were smarter than him. <laughs> and Oppenheimer didn't have any of those faults. You know, he hired people who were the best he could find. And he knew they were smarter than he was and uh, didn't bother him. <laughs> so he was a, a genius as a scientific administrator. And I think Groves recognized that. Uh, Groves was the one who picked him. And Groves was a smart man too. He was a very good administrator. So they were a good team. <laughs> Well, what a what a fascinating little piece of history we are now. Where you know you're talking about how Russia made the Soviet Union anyway. Yeah, yeah. Made such a series of incredibly costly, uh, you know, in human terms, hard to even measure. Yeah. In economic terms, remarkably stupid decision after stupid decision, grounded in an, a pursuit of an ideology. Well, they did they did that in biology in the 30s, 40s even 50s and 60s uh, with Lysenkoism. You know, if you don't know about Lysenko, uh, you should learn, but you probably do. Lysenko was a practically illiterate farm extension agent from Ukraine, but he managed to convince the Bolsheviks in the 20s that, uh, you know, all of biology was a capitalist plot and that things like hybrid corn that Americans were beginning to use were just nonsense and that you shouldn't do that and that, uh, you know, you could plow up the fields in northern Siberia and plant wheat and it would bring good crops, you know. <laughs> it was all nonsense, but the, he had complete political support. So uh, you could uh, get fired from your job if you taught about Mendel's experiments with peas, you know, and inheritance of uh, uh, the properties from your parents. And uh, that was all heresy, you know, that that was all capitalist propaganda. And so he cleaned out the field of biology in the Soviet Union and uh, especially in agriculture. And so they, they were always in trouble with agriculture. You know, crops were always failing. There was one madcap experiment after another, much like the Paris Agreement, and uh, it it finally ended, but not until the end of Khrushchev. People thought it would end after Stalin, because Stalin was a big supporter of Lysenko, but then turned out Khrushchev, uh, he was a fellow Ukrainian, so Khrushchev supported him too. And so he, in fact, one of the uh, raps against Khrushchev when he was finally deposed was that he had supported the ruin of agriculture in the Soviet Union through Lysenko. And so the the article in Pravda the next day after Khrushchev was uh, forcibly deposed uh, mentioned, you know, his support of Lysenko. So that was the end of Lysenko. 
but and so you know if if that's the way we have to get rid of the Paris Agreement and climate, I'm it's all right with me. <laughs> uh, well, I tell you, um, there's that great line in "The Sun Also Rises," in which one of the secondary characters who had formerly been very, very wealthy is asked by uh, an, another character in the book, you know, how did you go bankrupt? And he said two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And one suspects that that's how this chapter may end. Um, I don't think Americans have felt the economic impact yet. I live in California. It, it, I live in Marin County. California. You can park at the Costco and there'll be 10 cars and three of them will be Teslas. And I suspect next year, four of them. Something like 35% of all the new cars sold in Marin County last year were Teslas. One year. They sold 1.2 million units of the Model Y alone in the United States or worldwide. It's the, it's the largest selling car ever made. The direct beneficiary of um, a combination of, I think, real automotive innovation and virtue signaling. And, you know, so you see gradually these things happen, but Americans have not felt the economic impact of this in a real way yet. Well, and you know, Tesla is heavily subsidized, you know, so it's, it's right. you know, it's inverse Robin Hood, you know, rob from the poor to give to the rich Californians, you know. One of my last visits as a DOE official was to uh, a lab in DOE lab, Department of Energy lab in California. And I noticed that there were some Teslas being charged there. And I looked at the meter and they're being charged at 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And when I <laughs> went home, I looked up the cost of electricity in Palo Alto and it was, you know, 35 cents a kilowatt hour. So the poor Mexican, you know, gardener who was tending the uh, <laughs> grounds in Stanford was paying three and a half times as much for electricity as the rich people, you know, parking their Teslas at the government funded lab. You know, so it's, it's profoundly uh, corrupt, you know, it's, it's unjust <laughs> and uh, it's only getting worse. Uh, you know, the Mexican gardener is not going to buy a Tesla. He's going to continue to have to buy <laughs> you know, make do with whatever he can afford. And, uh, well, at some point it will break. Yeah. One, one, I mean, it won't it, 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 this is one of those laws, right? At some point it, it will break. It broke in the Soviet union. Right. It, it's, it's broken everywhere that it's gone on long enough. Sometimes it breaks in such a disastrous way, you know, that you're Carthage. Uh, sometimes it breaks in a way that's your Weimar, you know, but eventually things, the, there's something about the human spirit that seems positively co corrective, self-correcting, that humanity continues to move forward. I mean, despite all these problems, we're really living our best lives in the history of humanity right this moment, only to be replaced by the next moment, which will be a little bit better so far so i just wonder what is that change agent could it be an election is that even possible or at what point i mean do we need a crop failure what is it is well, there that was what happened in sri lanka there was a cr massive crop failure and that brought an end to this craziness but it, it was pretty uh brutal end you know uh, they talk about this is the world, the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. But in this case, it ended with a bang. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and you can sort of see that, you know, that has kind of happened in Holland. You know, the last election, a uh, uh, right wing party has taken over. And uh, there are a number of reasons, but certainly the climate policy of the previous government was part of it. You know, it sort of over, you know, takings again that Kim mentioned in there, they were taking farms and paying the poor farmers sort of 10 cents on the dollar, you know, in order to save the planet. And uh, you can't do that with a nominally democratic 
country like Holland and, and expect to stay in office. So I think one thing that we have to watch very carefully is uh, keep some semblance of democracy because the other side doesn't like democracy. You know, they complain about how hard it is to save the planet with democracy. You know, people don't like to commit suicide so they can save the planet. And uh, so, you know, if they had their choice, it would be like, it wouldn't be like Holland, it would be like Cambodia, right? And Pol Pot, you know, so there, there are a lot of Pol Pot wannabes uh, in this movement. What a fascinating well, thing. Yeah. Dr. Happer, my hope is, as we've had all these conversations, and again, the film that uh, you're recently involved in, Climate the Movie and Climate Conversation, those two movies, I think, just complement each other so well. But what I've really learned out here in Colorado, I'm, I'm actually renaming us Coloradical because we are just out of our minds right now with some of the legislation. There's legislation that's going to outlaw certain air conditioners in a couple of years. And so what I find so ironic is the those in the climate change movement, uh, they're so concerned about the climate, the macro climate, but they surely don't mind changing the personal climate of everyday Americans on how we heat our home, um, how we move about. So our own personal economy, our own personal climate, they want to control under this, as, as Dave said, the scary things out there, and as Patrick Moore had mentioned. Um, and um, I think more people are realizing this. I think the question is, what should we do? What are you telling people to do? Well, I think you, you need to do what the uh, Dutch did last fall. You need to vote them out of office as soon as you can. You know, and uh, unfortunately, usually that means they've done a lot of damage to finally wake people up, you know, before they get voted out. Mm -hmm. Be better to vote them out before they do the damage if you could somehow do that. And uh, so, for example, if you could point to other uh, countries or states that are, have done what they propose to do and, uh, and the disasters that it has brought with it, you know, that might help a little bit. But uh, so far, there, there are not that many examples. Every, every, every state is unique. Colorado is not the same as New Jersey or California. And uh, I don't know what's happened to Colorado. I, I always used to think of it as uh, a state with a lot of uh, independent-minded self-reliance. <laughs> That's what we thought, too. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, sons and daughters of pioneers, but it's somehow it's uh, it's a looking a lot more like uh, you know Greenwich Village or, or Venice, California. You know, and I think that's one of the reasons why, with Walt living here in Colorado and being a ge geophysicist all these years, that I mean, there's a lot of really exciting things happening in Colorado, and I think the fact that Walt did a climate conversation here in Colorado. I mean, bringing in experts, you know, from throughout the, uh -huh. the country and Canada. But I think that it's really telling. I find it really exciting. And again, I think a climate conversation and climate the movie, I mean, both of these things together really shed so much truth and light on this issue. And I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I, you know, I, I'm confident we'll eventually win this. You know, I, I hope it's during, during my lifetime, but probably not. But, uh, you know, one thing that would help a lot is somehow get to the children and uh, try and correct some of this misinformation. You know, part of our problem is we've got this brainwashed generation. They're good people, you know, they're not bad people. They've just been misled. And it's very hard to undo that. You know, and so, you know, one easy place to start would be with homeschooling and uh, some charter schools and maybe parochial schools where you can uh, uh, get a hearing and start teaching honest science uh, again about climate. So, for example, you know, in the CO2 coalition, we have a what we call a, a learning center. And Love so that. we're pr providing teaching materials for homeschoolers and for uh, charter schools and anyone who 
like to use it. But in the process, you know, we, we've got a number of former teachers. We've got a, a Sharon Camp, for example, taught chemistry for years in Georgia. She's been leading that effort. And uh, it's been brought to my attention what's being taught. I can hardly believe what, what these poor students are being taught. For example, I just reviewing a uh, experiment that they all do where, where they, uh, you know, put a, a, uh, a beaker of water in a bell jar and then they make CO2 by putting an antacid tablet into vinegar. And it, so this CO2 comes up and then they measure the pH of this fresh water, you know, and they say, see how the ocean is getting, is getting acidified. And sure enough, the fresh water acidifies, but no one tells them that the ocean has this enormous buffering capacity. You know, it's got an alkalinity of, you know, you know 2.3 millimolar per chemist. That's just staggeringly large. And add all who you like, it doesn't make any difference. Wow. So they, they do this completely phony experiment that gives a, a completely phony answer. Yeah, and, and yet everyone in America, all these poor kids are doing it and uh, and they've been yeah, they've been deceived. <laughs> well, it's great the work you're doing at CO2 Coalition as well. Yeah. It's great. Well, it, it's it's going to be tough to convince people who don't think there are men and women <laughs> to uh, you know, uh, understand the alkalinity of the ocean uh, uh, <laughs> might be a little bit beyond what they're capable of. But, you know, I'm old enough. I remember when Carter was president and when Reagan came along with a new message uh -huh. and how it changed uh, the country flipped. It yeah. just and we went from a period of stagnation and unhappiness and unrest and Watergate and Carter and Nixon and Iranian hostages to an explosion of American goodwill. Um, whether or not that turned into hegemony or whether or not Hegelian dialectical is inevitable, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it was a good time in 1982. I remember that. <laughs> and it lasted for, I don't know, many, many, many quarters consecutively. I wonder if it's just historians will judge Reagan to have been one of our best presidents. You know, I, they, 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 they won't like doing it, but they will have to eventually admit it. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, well, Kim, I don't know if you have more, Walt, you want to add more, yeah. but I feel that we've, uh, you know, we have been so fortunate to be joined by a great American, a remarkable scientist, a, an articulate, American. Um, we're just so grateful to have you with us today, Dr. Happer. You're, you're just terrific. Thank you. Well, let me thank the Climate Conversation also, because uh, this is the Lord's work you're doing. You know, this is uh, a movement that has to be uh, stopped. And uh, we will stop it. But uh, you're making that happen sooner. And so that will save a lot of damage. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your support. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. See you. Uh,